Hello and welcome to the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann. My guest for this episode is Aaron Harvey, a trained permaculture designer who owns and runs the Kale Yard, a small-scale farm in Granville, Ohio. She set out in 2011, after many years of working farms for others, to sow the soil for herself. We focus largely on her work of becoming established, finding land, developing solutions within the limitations she discovered, finding markets, and establishing customers along the way. As tends to be the case, that's only an overview of some major topics, with other pieces filling in along the way. I wanted to talk to Erin because she's a friend of mine, and I knew we could have a candid conversation about the process of transitioning to farming in a realistic, on-the-ground way, without romanticizing the experience or implying that this is an easy path for everyone. That candor comes through when we cover how much land she farms, her yields, her income, with further personalizing farming by including the restrictions she set for herself in how to approach farming on her own terms. There are lessons here for all of us, inside and outside the lens of permaculture, when we look at producing food and the decisions we need to make. Now, on to the interview with Aaron Harvey. I'll join you afterwards for some more thoughts. If you could give us a little bit of your background, how you came to permaculture, and then began farming. I got interested in farming first. I started working on farms in college and then worked on an urban farm for a few years, and then went to California for some more formal training in organic farming. And all along the way, you know, I kind of heard about permaculture and word was batted around a lot, but I was really unclear on what it actually meant, Um, but I was curious. And to be honest, always a little skeptical. (laughs) The training programs were always, you know, go to this tropical location for two and a half weeks in August. And as a farmer, that was always completely impossible and not necessarily desirable either. Uh, So finally, the permaculture course that I took, that we took, was a weekend format course. And so that actually fit with my schedule and was stretched out over the course of a, a growing season. So it was finally the first time that I could entertain the idea of doing a course so mostly I did it just because I was curious and I wanted to see what it was all about, kind of answer my skepticism, and ended up loving it. It just really spoke to me as a way of thinking about the world. And then when you were done with the permaculture course that we took together in Pennsylvania, you moved back west to begin your life as a farmer in Ohio? I did. I had grown up in Ohio and then lived in Pennsylvania for about seven years um, and meanwhile working on farms and then finally felt like I was at a point where I was ready to run my own farm and I had enough experience and resources and then an opportunity opened up where I had access to some land and someone to start a project with and that was kind of that was what did it. I wasn't ready to to strike out on my own. And so I wasn't like settled where I was and the farm I was working at was wonderful, but I kind of felt like I had learned most of the things that I had wanted to learn out of that experience. And so I moved back to Ohio and started a, oh, about one acre farm with a friend just with the goal of growing mixed vegetables and cut flowers for our farmer's market. And my understanding is that when you started that farm, that there were quite a few issues with trying to get ready for market because of the weather that we had that year here on the East Coast, that it was kind of wet and scary and crazy. Yeah, the last two years have been real doozies here in Ohio and I'm sure the rest of the eastern United States, too. In both years, I found myself in the situation of starting on new land and, and starting a new operation. Uh, 2011, when I moved back, was like the coldest, wettest spring on record. And here we were trying to break ground on a new field and waiting and waiting and waiting for the ground to dry up so we could get in there. We hired a friend with tractor equipment to come fill for us initially. And I would joke that we weren't going to be able to get into our field until June. And we ended up 
killing, I think, on May 30th. <laughs> so it very nearly wasn't a joke, but it really set us back. You know, we had planned to be in the ground much, much sooner. We had all these plants started in greenhouses, just hanging out, getting really tall and leggy and waiting on us. And you just can't do anything until the soil's ready for you. So that was a really frustrating experience. And then even once we got in the field, it continued to be very cold and wet. Like we have pictures of, we built raised beds. And even after we had our tomatoes and peppers in the ground, we have pictures where it's like a moat in the pathway around the raised beds. So it continued to be very, very wet. And then this past year, 2012, was kind of the opposite scenario. And it got just super hot really fast. And then we had just like hot drought conditions for a good part of the summer. So kind of dealing with a whole different set of experiences. You mentioned having to start with new ground both times. The first time you were building raised beds, which I guess with the cold and wet, you help get your plants up out of that water and also provide more solar exposure to your beds to keep them warmer since it's cold. With the drought-like conditions, were you irrigating more, or were you implementing other techniques to try to keep your plants alive? It was interesting because the site where I am now, <laughs> I have a rather imperfect irrigation system, but one which I'm pretty proud of because my irrigation system is completely off the grid so far. There's a creek that runs alongside my garden, and there's some slope there. And so the folks that own the property where I farm, he is a soil scientist and geologist and helped me out immensely getting started and was really excited about helping me build a gravity-fed irrigation system. So that's what we did. And so my the way I watered this last year was there was a, a line that ran for a few hundred feet through the creek with an intake up above an elevation of, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 feet higher where the water would enter. And then it would just run down to a tank that I had in my garden. And then I would take water from the tank and basically hand water from there, which is uh, really tedious and more than one person can do. And I'm hoping to improve that for this coming season. And I had thought that I could do some other things. I had thought that I could run some overhead irrigation through sprinklers, and I had ordered a solar-powered pump that was supposed to do that. The pump ended up not working for me. And then I also thought I would be able to do a little bit more with, again, gravity-fed sort of drip irrigation in my beds with a series of hoses from the tank. But... Like, it kind of worked, but the amount of time it took to, like, move the hoses and whatever and the rate at which the water was happening, I just ended up, I just ended up watering by hand. But because I knew that that's what I was working with and that I wasn't going to have time to water everything properly or to the degree that a lot of growers would, I did a ton of mulching, which was, like, a godsend, and... Some things I just cut my losses and I was like, you know what? I can't water all of this. It is what it is. And if I lose it, I lose it. It's a drought year. But I feel like I also was able to do a lot more than some folks because of the method I use for starting transplants. I use soil blocks. What you do is you start with a really high compost content potting mix and you have these like metal forms and you press out cubes of soil and you plant your seed into that. And then you can even kind of pop them up into a graduated larger size block, but you get really healthy transplants with a really good root system. And so I feel like my plants going into the ground had a really good jump start. And so if I could water them in really, really well initially and mulch them immediately, then just so much of the moisture was conserved and then, you kind of let the plant develop its own root system and find its own water. My tomatoes probably only like watered in and then watered once or twice more and then let them go. Same with the peppers, same with things that I was transplanting at a pretty good size, like 
chart or kale, things like that. And because I've been following your work, I got to see pictures of many of the heirloom tomatoes that you were producing of all sizes and colors and varieties. And to hear that you've only watered a couple of times, I think about my tomatoes here in Pennsylvania in the middle of the summer, there are some times where I'm watering twice a day, even with a heavy mulch in my raised beds. Well, that's something that I kind of picked up in California. I was in Santa Cruz in the central coast of California, and there's this phenomenon there of dry farming tomatoes. And it works particularly because of their climate. They have a lot of fog. And so I think plants are actually using some of that moisture from fog, and that helps it along. But really, what some of the people I was working with were doing was studies of plants that got different amounts of irrigation and then looking at the root systems. And tomatoes in particular, they'll dig for it. Like, they will just grow an incredible root system. If you don't baby them, they'll they'll go looking for their own water, and so and then you get a smaller fruit, but also supposedly more concentrated flavor. So people just go nuts over these dry farm tomatoes. And I wanted to say, you haven't tasted like a Midwestern grown in heat tomato if you think this is good, but that's part of what inspired me to not water my tomato plants. <laughs> I think about my own experience growing tomatoes, and that's always one of the worst things when you know you're only a couple of days from harvest, and then the rains come, and your tomatoes that were still a little green, they almost double in size, and they're kind of watery and not as firm or quite as flavorful. Now I'm going to have to look up dry farming tomato techniques and see if I can have a better time with them this year. Now, a couple of questions from what you raised with your current farming plot. How much land do you think that you have? I have nearly exactly a half an acre. Now, I want to revisit that in a little bit to discuss your yields, but some other bits of this. What are you using for mulch? Mostly, I think I used straw. I would love to find other sources of mulch, either that I could grow my own or that are free. (laughs) But this year, I just needed mulch and I didn't have time or the means to deal with it. So I just uh, either bought or got free straw. Conversation that I've had with Ben Wise is that straw and wood chips make great mulch, but they also tend to uh, invite slug problems. Did you have many issues with slugs in your garden? Not so much. I think if anything, with straw, I've had issues with mice because it's a great habitat for them as well. And I definitely have slugs, but I don't know, I just always kind of thought when you move from like a backyard garden scale to a field scale, either because you have so much more, you're not noticing the slug damage so much, or it's less inviting, I'm not sure, but it wasn't really an an issue per se. You know, I find myself like picking a head of lettuce or esterol and like checking off a slug, but um, not to the degree that I'm like losing things. You didn't have an epidemic of just walking out one morning to find that the slugs had mowed down a portion of your farm. No, other things. As you bring that up, what other kind of issues have you had with creatures predating your produce? Well, I knew from the get-go that I just needed an effective deer fence, period. So that was the first thing I did, actually. After tilling, I built my deer fence because I knew I couldn't plant a thing. And so that was there. The town where I live is just epidemic with deer. They give licenses for people to bow hunt, like in the village. I have a friend who just hit a deer driving down Main Street last week, or rather the deer hit her driving down Main Street. So I built a deer fence, and it's been effective, (laughs) which is great. I can be inside my garden and see deer browsing on the other side of the fence and say, hey, (laughs) we're cool. But my main pest issue this year was groundhogs, and it was really, really terrible. I knew there were a lot of groundhogs, but I had never had an experience like this. I thought because I'm in a much larger pasture, I imagine that from most directions it was so much open ground that they would be too skittish to cover that much ground and wouldn't make it to my garden, and I was wrong. Um, But they took their sweet time, and they didn't really discover it until... June or July, I forget exactly when, but then they discovered my garden and then they just 
they had a found a smorgasbord and proceeded to basically eat all of my brassicas and leafy greens. And every time I'd walk down to the garden, I would startle them and see them running out. There was a point I had three beds of kale. They had munched every single plant of kale <laughs> there was. And it was really, really heartbreaking. It was like, one of us needs to go, you know, the groundhogs or me. So I had never been in a position like that before where I was in charge and I was able to figure this out. And what I ended up doing was building an electric fence to keep the groundhogs out, which was not really what I wanted to do. I don't have a lot of mechanical ability and I didn't really know how to build an electric fence or understand how to keep it working. And again, that's something that the gentleman who owns the property was a huge help with. He worked with me to set it up and miraculously it worked. So the goal is for this coming season, I'm hoping to buy a solar panel that will operate my electric fence because it was a sad day when we plugged that in and I was like, oh, the kale yard is no longer off the grid. (laughs) You know, I'm now plugged into the system. I know that I've seen plenty of solar powered mobile electric fences, so that shouldn't be a problem. And yeah, I think about deer and groundhog. Groundhogs have been one of my biggest problems with my garden because the yearlings will come in and they'll just sit beside a tomato plant and I can watch them from the window. They'll pull a tomato off and hold it in both hands and just eat it like a a human being would eat an apple. And they'll eat it down to like a core and then they'll just chuck it, pull another one off, just sit there, eat it, looking around, watching for things, chuck it, eat another one. Oh, it's just heartbreaking. And I just felt ridiculous. I was like, you know, groundhogs are ruining my life. (laughs) Rodents. But, you know, then on the flip side, I tried to say, hey, if groundhogs are my biggest problem, then I'm doing pretty well. This has been the year of deer for me because I I haven't put in a deer fence because I just didn't need one. There was a stream behind my house. The deer don't normally cross that. There's a road in front of it, so there's very little passageway. Usually the deer would just run directly through to go up the mountain and into the game lands and the woodlands. But I planted some maples moving into the fall, and I go out, and I realize that, oh, the deer have pruned them to chest height. My elderberry have been pruned all the way back. And making that call to a guy I know who practices forestry, and I'm like, I need some help. The deer did this to my maples. Are they ruined? It's like, no, 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 no. They're young enough. They'll come back. This will happen, and that will happen. The elder, those will regenerate. He's like, but you either need to start shooting them or put in a fence. Well, that's fascinating that they would come in for, like, crackling trees, but not vegetables. I didn't have a problem with them because most of my vegetable garden is in my front yard that has my best solar exposure and least chance for flooding. And it's as I'm establishing perennials out in another field, they just came through and started stripping everything this fall. But anyway, those are pest woes. When you mention the land that you have, is that a land lease that you're doing or is this an agreement you came to with the person who owned it to use some of the space? It's an agreement. Last winter, I went through quite a process trying to find a place to farm because I'm kind of unusual. Like, I knew I would like to have my own farm someday very soon, but I knew that I wasn't in that position yet. And even kind of less for financial reasons than more just for knowing where I was at in life in general. Like, I wasn't ready to commit to a place. I was kind of new to Ohio. I mean, I grew up here, but I was new again in Ohio and not quite sure exactly where I wanted to be or how my life was going to go. And my search was really initially based around the farmer's market because last year I sold in a really, really wonderful farmer's market. And I knew that if I didn't maintain my spot, I would lose it and probably never get it again because there's a waiting list and plenty of vegetable growers. And so my number one goal was to maintain the spot in the market. And so I was looking for something with proximity to Granville. And it's a really long, hard process and really also wonderful because, I mean, I feel like this is partly Ohio, but everyone I met and told my story to had land for me. That's probably not an exaggeration. You know, either they had land, their sister-in-law had land, they knew this guy down the road that had land. It was really wonderful. Like, everyone wanted to help me out and was really interested in the young farmer looking for 
a place to grow, but an acre of land <laughs> doesn't make a functional farm. <laughs> it had to be a very particular acre of land with a certain set of criteria like water, like access, like I can jump in and out at any hour of the day and feel comfortable doing that. Needed to be close to market, needed to be close to where I was living, which was still a mystery. So there was just a whole whole set of things to juggle. And I was kind of down to the wire. And just I had met these folks through our local food council. And they said, hey, maybe you want to come take a look at our backyard. And I thought, yeah, right. Um, and then I did. And it's, you know, a five-acre piece of property, beautiful little setting. They're wonderful to work with. And it just, you know, it was, it was very much a leap of faith. I, I barely knew them. I had to make a decision really quick. But it's worked out really well. And for, for this year, we had just an MOU, like an official agreement that we drew up together. And, yeah, we'll probably revisit that. I'll be on the same property again this year. And see where that goes. And MOU, that's a memorandum of understanding, just kind of a formal agreement to lay out what you were going to do and your access to the land and how they were going to respond to that? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And you say that you're farming a half an acre. You farmed a half an acre in 2012. Because they have five acres, is there an opportunity that you could expand what you're working with, or are you going to remain with just that half acre? I'll just stay put with what I have. That's, that was part of our agreement. I share the space with a horse or two. So I really took away some of the horse's pasture area. And then they also just really value the open space. So they said you can have up to this half an acre. They thought I was crazy when I <laughs> fenced in the whole half an acre and was convinced that I was going to plant it by like June 18th, I was like, oh, it'll be full by June 18th, according to my plans. And they looked at me, <laughs> this one small person, and they looked at this huge garden, and they thought I was crazy, but I killed it. <laughs> and now it's a trick of, okay, how do I best utilize this space? Because, you know, I can't have beautiful rotations and all this stuff, because sometimes it's just like, these plants need to go in the ground, and this is the one bed that's empty, they're going here. <laughs> so you kind of work with what you got. Now, I understand that you are splitting your time between a day job and farming, but with what you have, is that half acre more than enough to fill your time as a farmer? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's never enough hours in the day. Even if you were working full time, do you think that a half acre is about as much as you yourself could farm? with the stipulations that you've put in yourself and the technologies that you're trying to use? Or do you think that you could farm more if given the right set of circumstances? With the tools I am using now, which is pretty much entirely hand tools, which is a decision I've made, and the amount of time I'm willing to devote to it, and the fact that I don't live there, I live very close, but even just three blocks commute, I feel like is challenging sometimes. Like I daydream about being able to walk out my back door and there it is. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good limit to have. I feel like if I had some more space, I could do a lot more with crops that don't take a lot of care, like plant more potatoes or squash or things like that, that that don't require a lot of maintenance. But I really don't think I could do much more with crops with a high turnover or that take a lot of care, like tomatoes. There's about all I could do to keep my tomatoes picked this last year, you know, and every other day mandate kind of thing. As you're working to build towards having your own farm and needing to make the decisions to move forward, you found something that works until you can have that part where you can just walk out your back door and begin your farming. I would also love perennials in my life, and that's kind of, I feel like, what's missing. You know, I'm in this sort of transient stage of my life, and so, yeah, I'm limited to growing annual vegetable, you know, and flower and herb crops. Because of the perennials, is that an issue both of space and not knowing what your access to the land is going to be like in the long term? Yeah, just knowing that I don't want to plant something that I'm just going to have to walk away from a year or two down the road. Because your agreement is that you're you're farming a half an acre. You're not doing a permaculture installation on that half an acre for these people that you could walk away from. Right, right. It's a little 
unclear what will happen to it, you know, once I go. Of the tools that you're using and the technology on your site, one thing my wife and I have considered is using soil blocks. From the sound of it, you're very, very happy with making that decision. I love them. They're not for everybody, and if efficiency is your number one goal, they're certainly not for you. But if your goals are to have less plastic and to have really healthy plants and to gain a little bit of flexibility with your watering schedule, they're awesome. Because I find that as long as you keep them moist, they don't dry out so quickly, unlike very small plants in like a plastic cell tray, for instance, would dry out more quickly. Once soil blocks dry out, it's really hard to re-wet them, but if you can keep them really well watered, you have a little bit more play. I feel like they're just the healthiest starts I've ever seen. Like if you've seen plant roots in kind of traditional pots or cell trays or whatever, if it goes far enough, you'll get that root bound thing where the roots are circling and they don't know where to go. And then you have to like break up the root system when you go to plant to plant. With the soil block, it allows the plant to just kind of develop a natural root system. And then when the roots hit the edge of the block, they'll do what's called air pruning and they just kind of stop growing and sort of hang out. So they're happier longer in the soil block. And because you have to have a really high organic matter content potting soil for you to start with start in good place and provide a lot of nutrients to carry them through that stage. The biggest downside is the time that it takes to make the blocks themselves. So when you go to seed, it's not just, oh, let me whip out these trays. It's, okay, first I need to mix up my soil, saturate it, make my block. You know, you get pretty quick at it. And um, they make ones that you can use standing. So you could have your pile of potting soil like on your greenhouse floor and and do it standing, which is great on on your back and your arms and your fingers because you are just pressing these metal forms. So you can start to hurt your hands after a while. But I spent enough time in the winter cleaning up and sorting plastic greenhouse crap. And if you're going to reuse them in any kind of commercial setting, you have to sterilize them. And so I kind of feel like if you consider the labor throughout the year, it's, it's maybe a wash. Well, I just think about all the plastic trays that I've had that I use them for a season. And between moving them from my indoor growing lights where I put all my starts so that I can get a good jump on them to then move them out to harden them off that all that exposure just to the uv from the fluorescent tubes and then the sunlight i may only get two years out of the plastic and then they just kind of break apart or i wind up trying to recycle them or i just have this huge bag full of stuff that i don't have anything to do with it's something i've been considering i looked at them at one time and like some of the big step on soil block makers the cost of entry was a little bit higher than i was ready for I'm over at Johnny's Selected Seeds looking at their soil block makers, and it looks like they've got some that the hand ones have come down in price considerably. Yeah, and they should last, you know, take good care of them, keep them well rinsed so that the soil is not on them, degrading the metal or whatever, and it should last you for a while. It is a reasonable investment then. You come from a background with a lot of professional farming experience that a large part of your background between your education and the work that you do. And you and I had long conversations about the uh, orchard that you worked at before you left to move back west, back west, as as if Ohio in the United States is that far west from where I am. I know, yeah, that's funny. (laughs) More the direction that you traveled was west as as opposed to actually going out west. No, it makes it sound, makes Ohio sound exciting. (laughs) Well, there was a time when Pennsylvania and Ohio were the frontier as far as the yeah. country was concerned, but yeah. now it's you can hop on a turnpike and be there in a few hours, not days. But that experience that you have, one of the conversations that I've been having with folks is that farming really is a skilled labor between being able to plan when you're going to put things in the ground, what you're going to plant, what to take to market not just for a farm manager who's trying to manage their staff, but even for the staff to know what's ripe, what they need to pick if there's a lot of hands-on labor. 
even with all your experience, this doesn't sound like something that people should just try to drop into because there are serious risks with the investment that you could put into it, the time, the labor required. If someone wanted to develop the skills to farm and they wanted to move in that direction rather than just kind of throwing their hands in the air and saying, yes, this is what I'm going to do and diving in, what would you recommend to folks to get themselves ready to become a farmer and to develop the skills necessary to really do what's required to be successful? I'm a very sort of cautious person. <laughs> and so there's a lot of folks that just leap into farming. You know, they just go for it. And that's some of them are wildly successful. You know, like that's one way to go into it. But I really took my time and tried to get all the – the training I could, and I would highly recommend that. I would recommend working on a production farm, if that's where you think you want to go with it. I would recommend getting that experience and seeing what that feels like, seeing what it feels like. Well, you're not going to know what it feels like to run your own farm, to run your own farm, but you can at least witness your boss's lifestyle and how it's like a seven days a week thing, how certain times of year, you know, the weather just dictates your life. It's like so much more than a job. And so if you really want to farm, farm, you, you should know what you're signing up for. And like you were saying, there's a lot of skill involved. Like starting this farm this year by myself was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And it takes just an immense amount of self-motivation to keep going. <laughs> Around like July, August, you are so tired. <laughs> and, and, and it's just if you don't just turn on autopilot and just have the momentum to keep the swing, you will stop moving and you will never start again. You have to really want it. And it's just so rich with decision making. There are so many small decisions to make at every single turn, whether it's do I water this now? Do I wait? Do I harvest this now? Do I wait? What is my top priority? When do I cut my losses? How do I spend my time? What time do I need to go to bed <laughs> to be, you know, to continue doing this? Like there's just so many decisions to make that having some knowledge behind them so that all the decisions aren't overwhelming is, is really, really useful. And And if you're not at a place where you can go, quit your day job and go work on a farm <laughs> because that's a really difficult decision to make because the pay is lousy, the hours are long. I don't have a family that I am responsible to, so I've been able to make those decisions and I have enough financial security that I've been able to make those decisions that I could go get a $10, $12 an hour farm job that's seasonal and you know, I've been able to do that. Most people aren't in a position to do that. Just start where you're at. Just start growing stuff because until you do it and just start to get the rhythms of it and the intuitive sense of, oh, this is when I plant this. This is how I plant this. I plant this from direct seed. This needs to start in the greenhouse. And I need to start it around March. Like those are just kinds of things that are more or less intuitive to me now. And it's only because I've just spent the years around it. I think from a, a garden perspective, my wife and I, our gardener's lament is that there's always next year. Next year will be better. And for us, we're still, it's figuring out what do we want to grow that we're going to eat? What's worthwhile to grow to eat from like, just as gardeners, making these decisions about what's worthwhile for us. And then it's, you know, going through the catalogs, ordering this, ordering that. Then we sit down and we make the garden plan. Not necessarily where things are going to get planted because much as you described, it's one of those, okay, these are long and leggy, and if they don't go into the ground tomorrow, we're going to lose them. So where's some spare ground? But we're still at that stage where we have to sit down. It's like, okay, where are our seed packets? Oh, well, that package arrived two weeks late, so these seeds are already a week behind schedule. And if you're thinking about doing this as a – if you think about going to market or marketing year, what you grow – there's a whole other dimension of not just, oh, figuring out what do I want to eat and then taking it from there. There's what can I sell. So if you're thinking about going into it, that's something else you can do to prepare yourself is like check out the market, talk to buyers, find out what they want, find out what's missing. Don't just sit down with a seed catalog and be like, ooh, that's pretty and beautiful. I'll grow that because 
everyone else could be growing that too. And then you're just going to go to market and sit there. So that's a whole nother piece of it, the marketing end and, uh, and making decisions there. I think about that because, uh, what is it? Romanesco broccoli a couple of years ago was rare and it was, you would get a head that was not much bigger than like two fists. It was a, a relatively small head of broccoli and you were uh, here at least at the farmer's markets for the specialty growers who were producing it, you were paying five or $6 a head for this novelty. Mm-hmm. By the end of this season, I could get a head of Romanesco broccoli, the size of my son, that was two or three dollars. See, your goal is to be the first person to grow Romanesco, <laughs> which is that's actually one of my goals right now. <laughs> I guess then it is. It's one of those. Well, if I can grow cauliflower really well, that's great. But if it's only selling for seventy-five cents or a dollar a head mm-hmm. in your local markets, then it doesn't really get you anywhere. And you know, trial and error is largely how you're going to figure those things out. And I talked with an extension officer, one of the fellows who I interviewed, Seth Wilner, was talking about where he is. Corn sells for, I don't remember the exact number, I'll just say $4 a dozen. But he said that depending on who the farmer is, how they're growing and what their inputs are, it could cost a farmer anywhere from $2 to $7 a dozen to grow it. Well, you can't sell it at $7 a dozen because the market won't bear that when everybody else is selling at these lower prices. How can you be productive and make money doing that? And there's some great resources out there, books about business for organic farming and, and doing that kind of evaluation and stuff. Less well, sexy side of it, but a good way to spend some time probably. Well, if someone's research-minded, it'd be something to look into to help make that decision. And I think Eric Tonesmeyer mentioned a book about business for organic farmers. I'll look through the archive and see if I can find that and include a link in the show notes because there was a book somebody else mentioned about the totally non-sexy, this is how you plan to have a farm, do this first, put a business plan together, this is how you find money to invest. Is that something, are you building entirely out of pocket for your farm, or did you seek grants and other aid? I have been totally shoestringing it. One of my sort of rules for myself is that I was not willing to go into debt, and also not willing to invest much of anything because I'm probably just going to walk away again (laughs) from my garden. So it's been very interesting to see the limits that places on me. Like, for example, where I live, there's another young farmer who's got started the same year I did. And in some ways, we're very similar. Like, we both had a lot of training and, you know, both grow organically and I hope wind up with kind of a similar looking quality product at market. But the way we get to market is it's pretty different because we have completely different ways of starting. I'm just me on a very small scale, not using really tractor equipment other than initially and like as low investment as possible. And his method is kind of the opposite that he with his whole family, has invested hugely in a piece of land and developing it and doing everything the right way, the best equipment and systems and everything. And he's just been focusing in his first years on laying all that groundwork and will have a really, really amazing farm very soon. But it's been a really interesting parallel to to watch us next to each other, kind of similar in age and situation, but just making different decisions. And... Part of the, my reasoning in making that decision is that he is a full-time farmer, period. And I'm choosing not to be a full-time farmer. And sometimes, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I should be doing this. I should have this. And I have to remind myself, like, it's okay. You, like, you have made the decision to put your energy into other things as well. <laughs> and this is the result. I really would like for my farm or garden or whatever you want to call it to be sort of a laboratory of, hey, so you have a job still, you don't own a farm yet, or you have other demands on your time, whether that be a family or needing to make money, and yet you still want to grow a whole lot of food in as small a space as possible with as little investment as possible. One of my goals is is to kind of work on that under that set of conditions and see what I can do and then share that. You really have your own nice personal little experience going on 
or not experience. You have your own nice personal experiments going on within your own boundaries and seeing what you can and can't do. A friend of mine who's a writer often says that the boundaries that he puts on himself are what sets him free. That when the world's wide open and you have all these choices, it can be easy to keep making decisions that carry you away from where you want to be. But as soon as you start putting restrictions on yourself and narrowing in on your goals, that it opens up many opportunities for where you can go with it. Yeah, that's great. With building your farm and setting your markets, like you said, the one farmer's market you knew that if you didn't go back to, you would lose your spot. How did you find and connect with your markets and get into them? Was it just like you knew the town that you were in, so you went around and found the different farmer's markets and then found who owned the market and just saw if you could get a space in it? Was there some networking involved to get in? Well, where I am in terms of farmer's markets, there aren't many options. Uh, like in our county, the market where I sell, the Granville Market, is an amazing market. And when I moved back to Ohio, and I was farming with was from here, you know, that's where she shopped. And so she knew this is a great market. We should try to sell here. And so initially we were just like on a waiting list. In 2011, only got in with a partial season spot. Like we were taking the second half of the season after somebody else who was just there the first half was done. And so we kind of took what we could get. And then after getting our foot in the door, then I was able to have a full season spot this year. And the amount of time, like the short period of time in which I've been able to develop a customer base has to me been like one of the coolest things about this. It's just wonderful people that just very quickly decided they wanted to support me <laughs> and buy from me. And I've been able to grow some unusual things that aren't at the market. Like I was pretty much the only person that had carrots, which kind of blows my mind, but um, I'm kind of like the carrot girl now. And things like that really let me kind of establish myself. And now I just like, I feel like that's my market. Like I, it's a really wonderful community and feel really blessed to have ended up there, but it's kind of the only option for good markets in uh, the area. If I, wanted to go into Columbus, which is only a, about a 30, 45 minute drive, depending on where you're going. Then there's a whole lot of options. But uh, one of my goals has been to do as little driving as possible and stay as close to home as possible. So staying local keeps you where you are and at the Granville Market. And I don't have time <laughs> to drive to Columbus. Initially, I thought I was going to have to do two markets, do the Saturday market that I do, and then I imagine myself doing a weekday market in Columbus or trying to get restaurant accounts in Columbus and going there one day a week and impossible for me as one person with a job, just completely impossible. So like you said, sometimes limiting yourself provides you a lot of freedom. And once I made the decision of I am going to just focus on this Saturday market and that is enough for me this year, that was a really wonderful <laughs> And then along the way, you know, through the, the relationship, I've developed through my day job, like now I've identified some other, not farmer's markets, but markets for myself that I hope to pursue this year and that are close to home. And that's, that's pretty exciting. So if you want to do something like a very small scale CSA or something like that, you have some other possibilities there, or are you thinking more like small restaurant contract? The place I work is uh, an eco general store called the Going Green Store. And in the last six months or so, we've developed a local grocery section. And we kind of experimented with selling fresh produce this year and didn't go very well. <laughs> like, that's very hard to do at a small scale because you need a, a certain amount of produce to draw people in to make them realize that there's produce there, but yet farmers don't want to leave produce. It's just going to sit and rot. You know, like the shelf life is so small. And so it's like a, which comes first, <laughs> you know, the, the demand or the supply. So we are going to develop a kind of harvest to order system this year. So I'm kind of started out sort of being the guinea pig for that. Like I collected customer emails and would put out a list like, hey, this is what I have. Send me an email by this time. Pick it up on Saturday. So I'm I'm going to pursue that rather than a traditional kind of CSA because I'm just me and I don't want to and can't really grow the variety that you would need to. And again, I don't like the idea of being in debt to, people, to members for the season. 
this is going to kind of take the place of my second market. That feeling of the customers paying you up front that even though you're creating a relationship with them, that it's an indebted one because now you owe them over the season all of this food and other things. And if something goes wrong, then you're not able to properly fulfill that obligation. Right. You know, and, and they're signing a contract saying, oh, we understand that we get what we get and this is the nature of farming, but you still feel bad. <laughs> Even if it's totally the weather's fault, you still feel bad. Well, and I've heard, though I haven't experienced it directly, I've heard from some others secondhand that they know of CSAs that started, delivered, you know, so many weeks and then just collapsed. And there are folks who are out then of that CSA share. So I've only got a few more questions real quick, two really, before we wrap things up. One is, what kind of yields were you getting out of this half acre? Were you happy with the amount of, of produce and product that you were able to deliver to your customers? All in all, yes. Like for a drought year, it kind of at a point just felt miraculous that I was harvesting anything. You know, I would have been much, much happier if it hadn't been for the groundhogs. Like that was a really big setback. I'm the kale yard. That's my farm name. And there was a big, long stretch where I didn't have any kale because the groundhogs ate it all. So there were some, some real disappointments like that. But all in all, I was really pretty pleased. Winter now, I have a lot of math to do, and I want to sit down and do some of that boring sort of like, okay, which crop actually is making you more money kind of stuff. So right now, it's really just kind of anecdotal that like, yes, I was pretty happy, and I hit some serious limits. Like, I hit the limit of I had more than I could fit into my vehicle in the market. I had more than I could sell on a Saturday. I had more than would fit on my market table, given the... The scenario I was working with, uh, was pretty happy with my production. And with doing everything on a shoestring and happy with your production, as your second year kind of going at it, at it, were you happy with your income from farming part time? Yeah, I think that I am going to be kind of in the neighborhood of breaking even this year. So my income was nil, but for Starting a business, that's, that's par for the course, right? Like you should expect a few years of not making any money. So breaking even was sort of my goal and uh, be pretty happy with that, hoping to actually make a little money in the coming year. But it's a labor of love. You know, it's, I, even with all the experience I have, given the scenario I'm working with, like I don't think I could ever make my entire living doing this. So I'm happy that it, could maybe someday be a chunk of my income. So that's that's a different goal than maybe a lot of people would have or a different return than a lot of people would need to put so much energy and time into it. But as you say, throughout this conversation, you're limiting the ways in which you approach farming because you could, like the other young farmer, be in a situation where you were putting a lot of investment up front to build these things. If you had land that was permanently yours, that perhaps you took a year to build all of your beds and prepared that way or invested a lot of money or perhaps sought out grants or loans to kind of front load financially, that it could have been completely different results because of that. Or if you were in a case where you were part of a family where you could pursue farming full-time and that income wasn't necessarily something that was necessary in the beginning or that part-time job, that that would change the scenario for you. It's all of those variables in the way that you approached it, but you approached this from a very specific viewpoint of, well, as you said, you didn't want to plug in that electric fence because you were off the grid. You're working with hand tools after that initial groundbreaking that you're buying straw in as a po and other mulch material as opposed to growing your own. There are a lot of different ways to approach this, but within your own structure of doing this, you found the success that you were looking for for your first year going alone. Well, something I've been thinking a lot about in the last two years when I've been trying to figure out how I can make this financially work for me and my set of circumstances and getting to really know you know, most of the people at the farmer's market where I sell, and I feel like it's kind of this big secret that um, just about all of the small farmers 
like, there's a story there. There's a reason why they can afford to be doing what they're doing, whether it's they have a partner who has a real job with benefits, or this is a second career for them, or they inherited their family's farm, or they're just creeping by and they're doing this as a labor of love. But that's something I feel like is really important that people get to know farmers a little better and understand where they're coming from and not just go have this sort of lovely Saturday morning experience and think everything's hunky-dory because the way that big farms are subsidized and all the kind of insidious ways they are subsidized, like small farms are subsidized in a way as well. And so everybody has their little story that makes it work or not work. Well, and I think about those relationships because my local farmer, who I like to buy most of my fruit from, we have the conversations because it was last year. They didn't have a lot of cherries because of when the cherries bloomed, it got cold and they wound up destroyed like 30% of their cherry harvest. And then this year, because it was dry, they were irrigating and a lot of the fruit that they were producing, it was either this wonderful stuff or it was kind of hit or miss. And it was like week to week, depending on how the weather was. And knowing how that goes and hearing the story, and it's like, oh, I see fruit prices are up a little this year. And he's like, I wish I could raise them more to cover my costs because this is one of those years I've been irrigating for the last six weeks just to get this to market. Knowing that and then having that conversation, and he's like, you know, all of the pumps in order to get from my water source out are gasoline powered. And I'm burning so many gallons per hour per field to do that. And knowing what those numbers are. I've had some conversations with folks about that whole thing. It's like, well, why do you buy from these particular folks? I'm like, well, I know them. I know their first names. They've watched my children grow up from when my wife and I started shopping there when she was pregnant with our first. And they've seen my kids through the years and they come in and it's, hey, here's a slice of this. How are you doing? What's going on? Knowing those stories are part of that. Once you have that personal relationship, it's just a whole different ball game. It's not, oh, this costs 20 cents more. I'll go buy this one oh, that's Jack's tomato. Like, that's what I buy. (laughs) You know, this is who I get my teas from. This is who bakes my bread. This is who grows my salad, you know, and it just, yeah, it just changes a lot once you have the actual relationship. And the cool thing about that, though, for me also is it's that when I go to market, I can go, hey, what's, what's coming up? What do you got going on? And I, well, my market is open Tuesdays and Fridays. It's, you know, I go on a Tuesday. It's like, well, what's coming up? Well, Friday, I'm thinking I'm going to have some of these, but you want to make sure you're here next Tuesday because that's my first truckload of this. And wondering what this strange white and green melon is. And he's like, oh, well, that's a snow leopard melon. Well, what's it like? He's like, well, why should I describe it to you? Pulls out a pocket knife, gives me a piece of it. One of those, well, I don't grow this. I'm bringing these in for my neighbor. And I'm like, well, I think you need to tell your neighbor to keep growing them. Put two in my bag. And that changes it and really helps me plan being able to have those conversations and know what's there. That whole relocalization, talking to your farmers. These are the people who your money goes to. You know where that money is going. But that's entirely other conversation about invisible structures and people and relocalizing. But yeah, I find that that farmer relationship really changes the way that I eat and the way that my family eats. And knowing that a lot of those folks aren't taking any kind of subsidies. You're paying what the local market will bear and it's their income. Mm -hmm. I talked to another farmer and It was her and her husband, and when she talked about how much their actual income was for the year, knowing how many animals they processed, how much they raised, what markets they were selling at, that they had a CSA in addition to these other things, and it was like they were reaching out in six different ways to have an income, and then she said exactly how much their income was the year before, and I just kind of scratched my head, and it's like, oh, you mean for your entire year, all this work, that was what your income was? Yes. I found a wonderful quote the other week that I pinned up above my desk. With, In farming, it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you don't have to spend, which is, is not everyone's philosophy. But I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that kind of sounds <laughs> familiar. Those were some of our, the conversations that you and I had heading out of the permaculture design course, trying to go a different way and to kind of cut your own path. What does that mean? And the decisions that you have to make in order to make that happen. And even though a lot of this conversation has been about farming, it's 
the reason why I'm able to do this podcast right now is because my wife made the decision that this was important and that in order for me to have the time to build this show and do interviews with people such as yourself who have these wonderful experiences, that, well, she was going to be the one in the workforce and that I was going to be the one building this side of my life. But at the same time, every time I see her, she looks at me and she points at her wrist, knowing that there's a certain amount of time that these things have to happen before she wants the same opportunity. But anyway, that's a little bit more of my story, and you know a lot of that anyway. So, But before we bring all this to a close, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? Anything that you think that they need to know or think about when it comes to starting their own farm? Just one thing, kind of just picking up on on the thread we were just talking about. I think the one, the huge thing that I kind of took away from the PDC, the permaculture course that we took together, was it. I'm kind of sorry to say that I'm not sure it's had a huge effect on the actual day to day sort of farming decisions I make. I would like it to more and more as I get more experience and have a little more time and money or whatever to play with and experience and knowledge under my belt. But I think the biggest effect it had on me was sort of reevaluating my whole life <laughs> and the decisions I make and the, the values behind them. And so the kind of farming I've chosen to do is really influenced by that. Like some people, farming is really a business and they go at it making business decisions the whole way. And for me, it's more about my entire lifestyle. It's not my job. It's more like how I want to live my life. And so that's kind of coming back to that. It's not how much money you make farming. It's how much you don't have to spend. And so for me, it's part of a whole exercise of changing the fabric of my whole life, <laughs> which is a much bigger undertaking maybe than just farming. But um, I don't know. I just I feel like it's kind of important to know where I'm coming from with it when I talk about farming. Even though the PDC material and the idea of building permanent agriculture and those design methods aren't being applied to the ways that you're farming because of your previous education on water conservation and organic farming and all this other education, you still find that the lens of permaculture and the value of the PDC is in making better decisions about your life and what you value and don't value and how you can integrate all of that into your life meaningfully? Yeah. I guess maybe if I gave some examples, that would be helpful. It's kind of like, you know, I could have this year gotten a diesel-powered pump and pumped water out of the creek and <laughs> run that pump and some overhead watering or could buy a truck. <laughs> but there's just decisions I've made of just sort of like – respecting some limits and trying to keep an eye towards using less fossil fuel and technology and having a smaller scale that kind of integrates with other pieces of my life that are important to me. And those are kind of the things that I, I took from, from learning more about permaculture. Well, and as I sit in front of a computer screen talking to you and recording this and producing a podcast, I can say that those kinds of lessons have impacted my own life. And I think that there's still value in that, as we all find our own ways of navigating through this crazy thing that we call life and having tools to, to make better decisions. Thank you so much, Aaron, for taking this time. It's been nice to talk to you just to catch up in the time since the PDC and though we've stayed in touch, having a nice long conversation like this, but also that the places that our conversation went today also touch on many of the things that I wanted to cover to address some of these things that folks should think about when going into this kind of life and to share someone's personal experiences through this path because of the amount of experience that you have previously moving into this and the lessons that you've learned along the way. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. It's winter. It's nice to kind of take a step back and uh, think about these things <laughs> outside of the, the day to day. So thank you. And that was my dear friend, Aaron Harvey, and our not-so-sexy conversation about farming. Now you know how one small-scale farmer navigates her way through building a farm while maintaining other important lifestyle choices, even as farming reflects the lifestyle she desires most. 
whether as a full-time occupation or a budding business designed to grow slowly over the years, a path exists for anyone who wants to travel it and become a farmer. And as you heard in the last portion of our conversation from Building Markets Onward, an awareness of permaculture processes plays an important role for both of us as we move forward with our projects, planning, and lives to take care of one another by getting to know the customers we sell to or farmers we buy from, to observe by listening to their stories, and to foster slow solutions that meet our needs. In gathering information to make decisions, permaculture prompts us to start with why, and the details of answering that question also answers who, what, where, how, and when. One last note on the topic of farming. I found the book I was thinking about when Aaron and I were talking about farm planning and the business planning side of that. It's by Richard Wiswall and is titled The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, A Complete Guide to Managing Finances, Crops, and Staff, and Making a Profit. Until the next time, take care of the earth, yourself, and each other.